Bonjour. Merci d'être ici. That's all the French I will speak today, because it's not much better than that. But thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Martin Mulders. I work at a Dutch company, company called InfoSupport. We do consulting, we do data science. Actually, before it was hip, uh, we already did that. Today's talk is not about either of that. It's about something that we already use quite a lot, something that's been around for quite some time. Secure transport layers. So then the first, first question might be, why should we bother about it? If it's not new, if it's not hip, then why is the room packed? Why are people standing at the end of the room? Well, first of all, uh, I've seen in a lot of projects, and maybe you've seen it as well, that doing uh, secure connections is actually pretty hard to do. And often, if something goes wrong in a production environment, and it's something with certificates, we go to this one colleague because he knows how it works and he is usually capable of fixing it. And actually that's not a really good thing, I think, because if you run it, you should be able to maintain it, you should be able to understand what's going on underneath. Secondly, why don't we know that? Because it's actually pretty hard to understand. If you, you go through Wikipedia or go through scientific papers, you get a lot of mathematics, and if you're not skilled to read that, it might be pretty scarifying. But yet, on the other hand, uh, doing it correctly, having secure connections, is crucial in today's systems that are connected over, uh, over large distances, that are connected between enterprises. We must be able to ensure that our connections are secure, that no one's in between. And that applies even more now that we have cloud solutions and we have even solutions that span across multiple cloud providers, then we definitely need to make sure that everything is secured correctly. So, first of all, what actually are we talking about? Well, maybe you know this picture, it's from the OC layer, um, it's from the OC model, and it says that um, somewhere in the host layer, around there, we have uh, the presentation layer which should handle encryption without specifying how. Uh, and as you might also know, this is a theoretical model because it's not really implemented that way. And secure sockets, or transport layer security, and I'll use both terms a bit in between throughout the talk, actually says, no, 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 encryption is very important and we should do it down there at the transport layer. Because if our transport layer is secure, then our application doesn't have to care anymore about encryption being done correctly. And that's actually the power of the transport layer security, and that's what we're going to dive into this morning. So let's first of all take a look, because what actually is the issue here? Well, why are we having an issue? Here I have a uh, package uh, sniffer running, which will inspect all the traffic that is on my network, on my local network. And there's nothing right now, so that's okay. And now I'm going to do a simple network call. I'll act as if I'm a browser. Oh wait, I actually have a browser, so why not do that? Well, some kind of text, doesn't really matter what it is. But now I had this package sniffer running. And look what it does. There it is. It's a GET using HTTP 1.1. It returned the HTTP 1.1 200 OK status. And there is the body of the page that we requested, lorem, ipsum, and the rest, because I tend to forget what is after lorem, ipsum. Um, but now imagine that I'm not the eavesdropper myself, but somebody else is. Then somebody else has read my connection by now, and he has been able to read both the request and the response that came through it. This is what happens if you do not use transport layer security at all. And on my Mac, that might not be a problem, because I'm the only user on it, so it's fine. But if I'm talking to some kind of cloud service, and somebody else is in between me and the cloud service, and they can read my requests and my responses, then I might have a serious issue. And just imagine your internet banking not using HTTPS. I think we can all see that that's a pretty scarifying ID. A 
Okay, let's get back. So that's, that's what we're talking about. People being able to eavesdrop on our connections to other systems. How can we prevent that? And the first thing that we need to prevent that is a mechanism to encrypt data. And we'll be looking at public-private key encryption this morning. The second thing that we need is something to establish this trust relationship and knowing that we can use a certain combination of public and private keys. And we do that using signed certificates. And to be able to use signed certificates, we need something else, and that's certificate authorities. Before we do that, let's take a quick dive into history. Um, this is how uh, SSL, as it was originally named, was invented. Well, actually, it wasn't released because it wasn't good enough. Then SSL 2.0 and SSL 3.0 came out, and they were, uh, after some, some, some years, uh, broken using the Poodle attack. I won't be explaining what that is, but if you ever see SSL 2 or 3, don't use it because it's inherently broken. Then TLS 1 came out, which is almost the same as free SSL 3, but it was named differently. Uh, it wasn't vulnerable to the Poodle attack, but the Beast attack actually um, cracked that one as well, so not using that any anymore. Then TLS 1.1 and TLS 1.2 came out. And these aren't cracked as of yet, so you can safely use that. And there's a draft for TLS 1.3, but that's still not finished, so you can't use that either. The original spec was uh, designed by Netscape, but then later on it was taken into the public. Okay, so public-private key encryption. What's that all about? You can hear a lot about that, but how does it actually work? Well, the basic concept is actually just did. We have some kind of clear text over there, and we have some kind of cipher text over there. And there's a silver key, and we'll call that the public key. And there's a golden key, which we'll call the private key. And there's a mathematical relationship between those keys. Now, if I want to encrypt something to, for example, you, I look up your silver key, your public key, that's available to each and everyone in the world. I encrypt my message to you using that public key, and then it's got ciphered. Nobody else can read it. The only one who can read it is somebody who has the golden key. And since it's called the private key, you're supposed to keep it private to yourself, not share it with anybody. And that makes sure that you're the only one who can read the message that I wrote to you. Well, this might sound a bit theoretically. There's a lot of mathematics underneath. And we'll look at how that works in a more or less simplified way. So it's time for a little bit of math. You don't need a calculator. I'll do the calculations for you. And sometimes you'll have to trust me because the calculations are actually too hard for your average uh, mobile phone and even for your average MacBook. First of all, let's think of two prime numbers. We'll call them P and Q. I hope that even in the back everybody can read the mathematics. Can you confirm or not? Sorry? No. Not. Let's see if we can make it a little bit bigger. Doesn't scale, man. That, that's a disappointment there. I'll take a quick check if I can fix that for you because it would be a shame if you can't see that. We'll make the screen a little bit smaller. Is this better? No confirmation. Sorry, it doesn't go any lower than this. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, but I'll upload the slides afterwards so you can see along what happened. I'm sorry about that. I didn't calculate to have such a good display, actually. <laughs> The first time I gave this talk, the display was smaller and everybody could read it. Anyway, we have two prime numbers there. Let's call them P and Q. Um, and we give them um, the values 11 and 17. And we can all easily confirm for ourselves that 11 and 17 are prime numbers. Then we calculate, calculate P multiplied with Q. That's 187. And we'll call, call that the modulus. Now, we think of a random number between 1 and this modulus, this p times q, and we'll call that number e. And I just picked 3. I could have 
picked 42. Obviously, that's a good random number always, but this time it's free. And now the question is, find a value, let's call it d, for which it holds that d multiplied with this random number, minus 1, modulo p minus 1 times q minus 1, is 0. Okay, well, these are relatively small numbers, so we can solve that equation. And we can say, okay, well, 320 modulo 160 is 0, that's good. Um, 321 minus 1 uh, modulo 10 times 16, that's also still 0, and we can make it even more complex, and we can say, okay, yes, 107 times 3 equals 321, so that must mean that d equals 107. And if you don't believe me, just grab Excel or your favorite calculator and you can do it yourself. But D equals 107, and that means that 107 times 3 minus 1 divided by P minus 1 times Q minus 1 will give us a rest of 0. Now, if we would have picked another random number E, for example, 7, I'll save you the calculations, we get, a, we get a different D value, 183 this time. So it's important to keep that in mind. This, this, these two random, this random number E influences the other outcome, the D. Okay, now the question is, if I do not tell you P and Q, <coughs> can we do the same stuff? So I'm just saying we have P and Q, these are prime numbers, but I don't tell you which ones they are. But I will tell you the modulus. I will tell you that if you multiply the two of them, it's 299. And I'm also giving you this random number that I selected. Let's say it was 5. And now the question to you is, can you please tell me what's P and Q? And I'm pretty sure you can't. This is actually a very hard mathematical problem, even for small numbers. If I do know P and Q, though, 13 and 23, for example, well, it becomes very easy. I can just fill in the maths. It's not that really a big problem. And then it turns out that D is 317. And now the interesting stuff is that if I pick my P and Q values high enough, it will take almost an eternity to find the other factors. factors. And that's the power of public and private key encryption. Because that means that now we can distribute the modulus. Remember the 299? I can distribute the random number, the 5 that I just gave you, and still be sure that you won't be able to find the original P and Q. Let's try what happens if we apply this to encryption. Let's encrypt the letter G. And if we just follow uh, A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, then G is the letter 7, uh, the number 7. I have my P times Q over there, it's 187, and I have my random number there, it's 3. We can do uh, 7, so that's the letter G, to the power of E, so to the power of 3, which means it will be 343. And I can modulo that with 187, and it gets, gives me 156. So now my letter G has become the cipher text 156. Now if I do have the original P and Q, because I am the owner of the private key, I can decrypt this letter G. I got a 156, I know my D, I know my P and Q obviously, I can, and I can easily decrypt this, well, easily. I first have to calculate the encrypted value, 156, to the power of D, which is 107, and this is where your average smartphone or MacBook will fail you because they can't do this, it's too complex. Even my MacBook couldn't do it, so I need to have some custom software to just do that. Um, turns out this is uh, 4.6 with around 230 zeros behind it. Approximately. I can modulo that again with 187, which gives me the, val the value of 7 back again, which is the letter G. I decrypted the ciphertext by just knowing these two secret values. That's, in a very simplified way, how public-private key encryption works. 
I do not know what this cat has to do with it. It looks like some fairy tale figure, and it's not fairy tale time yet. Anyway, um, now if we know this, if we have this public private key encryption, we can establish a secure connection to some kind of remote system. And there's a protocol for that. It, that's actually the TLS protocol. And it involves quite a lot of uh, phases. And we'll go through that quickly. It starts with the client saying, hey, hello, I want to establish a connection. Um, this is the TLS protocol that I uh, support. Uh, here's some kind of random number. Here are some cipher suits uh, and compression methods. Do you have anything for me that matches this so we can be secure? The server will say, well, server, hello, yes. Um, well, let's pick this version of TLS and this cipher suit and this uh, compression method. Um, then the uh, server sends its certificate. And the certificate, we'll see that in a few minutes. That's actually a, a document. Um, and it will also send its public key. Done. Then the client will send his key. Done. And now the client can say, OK, from now on, we have, some we have established a set of uh, ciphers and compression methods that we both support. We have exchanged keys. From now on, everything will be encrypted using the keys and the ciphers that we just uh, agreed to use. And that's change cipher spec, and from then on, the connection is secured. And that's confirmed by the server. Yes, from now on, we'll talk in Cypher. OK, well, let's see how this works, because we've had a lot of, of theoretical stuff by now. But does it actually work? Well, this is, my, uh, th this is the same very interesting web page. But this time, um, I'm accessing it. And it might be hard to see, but over HTTPS. And Chrome says that it's not secure. Chrome does that because of validation issues with the certificate, which we'll get to later on. Um, but let's uh, take the, uh, the scanner, like so, uh, refresh the page. Nothing. That's not what I expected. I forgot to do a sacrifice to the demo gods this morning. Now, maybe it works if we use curl. Still nothing. That's boring. Now, well, I, I tried it earlier this morning, just to be sure. And now I'm happy that I did. <laughs> if you do this, then the package sniffer will display stuff like this. I can't see the lorem ipsum anymore. And if you can, you're a genius. Come talk to me afterwards. So the thing is that if I use HTTPS, then in the background, all this stuff happens, exchanging keys, exchanging cipher methods, exchanging compression methods, switching to cipher uh, connection. And then the package sniffer, who sits in between, is not capable of eavesdropping anymore. So now my connection is secured. Or is it? It's a bit hard to type if your cursor's over there. This is no fun. We'll switch back to curl then. Um, well, I can make this one bigger, by the way. Or at least I thought I could. I'm using demo.google.com. I don't know if it exists in the real world, but it exists on my MacBook. I've created a DNS entry on my MacBook that will point demo.google.com to my machine, actually. Oh, and I think I know what I did wrong there. Let's just double check. Double check. Uh, where are we? Your connection is not private. OK, well, 
I'm a dummy user, so I'll just say that I accept. Oh, well, Chrome doesn't even... Even if I say, yes, I know what I'm doing, then Chrome doesn't allow me to. That's a disappointment. Uh, curl is a bit friendlier there. Um, I'm connecting to demo.google.com, and now I get a warning from Curl. It says, Curl performs SSL certificate verification by default using blah, 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 blah. Okay, if you'd like to turn it off, use minus K. Yes, I want to turn it off because I want to show you something. Okay, welcome to Google, it says. So now I'm connected to Google. I might think, but I am not, because this certificate is issued to demo.google.com, but it's not verified in some way. And let's see what that actually means in practice. Yes. The second thing that we needed to establish these secure connections is signed certificates, as I told you. Now, a certificate is kind of like a document. And you might know that because you have a certificate as well, for example, saying you're a brilliant Java developer and you passed the OC, OCGP exam or something like that. And these certificates are no different. These are tiny documents that say, um, this is google.com. Uh, we have a private key that we're not telling you, but the public key that corresponds to it is this one. And uh, you can connect, uh, you, you can send us messages by encrypting them using that key. Okay, that's pretty useful because we need that if we uh, want, want to connect to them. Uh, and as you can see, there's quite a lot of stuff in, in such a certificate. It has a subject, uh, which is like uh, google.com. It has validity, so it will expire at some day. Um, it, it indicates what it can be used for and what not. It contains the public key. It contains a, a fingerprint over the public key, plus a way how to calculate the fingerprint, uh, and some kind of serial number. And this might sound like a brilliant plan because now we have just this one document and we know how to secure our connections, but that's not actually true. We need something else because everyone can generate a certificate. As I just showed you, I can generate a certificate with the uh, subject uh, demo.google.com. That doesn't make it really belong to demo.google.com. I'm just saying it is. So these certificates somehow need to be signed. It needs to be a signature on the certificate that says, yes, this one is true, it's valid. And uh, that means we have some kind of an issuer, that's the authority, the, the, the guy who's saying, yes, this certificate is really trustworthy, his signature or her signature, and the mathematical algorithm that calculated the signature. And that means we also need a way to sign stuff, because that's, that's cool, a signature, but a digital signature needs to be calculated. And for that, we can use the same public-private key stuff again. That's interesting. Here we have the, pub, the, the public key again. Here's the private key. And now let's assume that this is the certificate. If I have the private key, I can calculate some kind of a signature over the document, and it will add this nice green bar. It's the signature, it's saying yes, it's valid. And then here I have the signed document with the green bar. This is the public key, everyone is allowed to download that key and use it for whatever purpose. And I can use this public key to verify whether the, the, the signature is actually correct, whether it was actually calculated over the document as it is presented to me at this very moment. And if it's not, then I know that somebody has tried to tamper with the certificate. He has tried to change a few bits, maybe change the subject or the key. In a more mathematical way, it looks like this. We have a uh, signing function, which takes the secret key, which takes the documents, and it gives you some kind of a signature. And then we have this verifying function which takes the public key, the signature, and the original document, and it says either accept or reject. This is valid or this is invalid. And this mechanism is used to sign these certificates and ensure that they are trustworthy themselves. If you have the X and the T, and you know the 
the public key, you can tell whether the document was actually signed using the corresponding private key. Now, this brings us to the third thing that we need, which is certificate authorities. And a certificate authority is an organization or an entity that creates these kind of certificates. It certifies that the owner of the certificate is also the owner of a public key and that he has the private key, obviously. So, and, and this mechanism is actually used in a layered way. Let's, let's think about this. Uh, th this is me, um, here's John, here's Alice, and there's somebody else. Now, how do I know whether I can trust this somebody else? I don't know. But I do know that I trust John. John is a friend of mine. John happens to trust Alice. It's a friend of his. And Alice knows this person that I don't know. And because I trust John as a, as a, as a guy who can be trusted, he's, he's honest. And John has this very same relation with Alice. And Alice has this very same relation with the unknown person. We have a kind of a chain of trust. And I know that I can trust this unknown person. That's the ID. But in today's computers, who is John? Any clue? I did a quick check on my MacBook. There's 160 Johns on it. 160 certificate authorities, and most of them are big companies, like Verisign, like Symantec. These are the persons that I happen to trust. Well, do I trust them? Well, no, Apple trusts them. And I think I trust Apple. <laughs> but I'm not completely sure of that. And if you run your Java applications, you have about the same number of Johns by default. If you do not configure anything else, you also have around 160 Johns, persons that you happen to trust because Oracle trusts them. And we all trust Oracle, don't we? Well, the good news is that these certificate authorities are organizations with top-notch security procedures. I mean, if they sign a, a certificate, everybody in the world will trust it. So the key with which they sign their certificates is kept very secretly in a lock. And if they need to issue a new certificate, o oftentimes they have like their root certificate, which is really kept secret, and they have a delegate certificate that is refreshed every year or every two years or something like that, then they have a, a procedure that, that's written down in, in a journal of 180 pages, and it might take, depending on what exactly needs to be done, between three and eight hours to do the whole ceremony. They will invite people from the IT department, they will invite random employees of the company just to be sure that they can't be uh, bribed in beforehand. They will have video cameras installed in the room that record each and every movement. They will have microphones, they will have screen recordings, they will have uh, uh, notaries, each and everything is there, and they do all that just to make sure that their private key is not compromised. And yet, sometimes it goes wrong. Who knows what this is? Which nice little village this is? Well, no worries, neither did I before I looked it up. This is Beverwijk, it's a small city in the Netherlands. And I'm going to tell you a little fairy tale by now. Once upon a time there was a Dutch notary. It was called Diginotar. And it was living happily and, happily and carefree there in this little nice town of Beverwijk. But on a bad day, evil heard it. Really bad. There was an attacker that somehow managed to compromise one of their web servers. By the way, that was because of a security vulnerability in some kind of PHP component that was running on that public web server. So always make sure you install late patches and stuff. Um, but not only did he compromise this server, he was able to make his way through the company's computer infrastructure, one machine by one. By the way, that was because of the fact that all systems were running 
in the same Windows domain and thus had the same administrator password. Ouch. Reminder to self, don't do that. And finally, he managed to traverse into the machines that hold the certificates and the keys that correspond to it. Do you know what this means? Th this attacker was able to generate certificates with domain names and other keys for about every subject in the world, and they would appear valid in all major computer systems because this certificate authority was trusted by another certificate authority. This was real bad. Let's see what happened. Well, Google blacklisted the certificates of this uh, certificate authority, obviously, in, in their Chrome browser. Microsoft removed uh, the root certificate <coughs> of this company from all supported Windows releases. Mozilla revoked the, uh, the root certificate from this certificate authority, and Apple issued a security update. Now, a little note the little star over there. Microsoft removed the, remo the, the root certificate, but this Windows update was delayed for the Netherlands by one week. And you don't want to know why, but I'm still telling you, because the government asked Microsoft not to roll out the patch. All government certificates were also signed by this CA, <laughs> and they were afraid that if Microsoft would push the patch to all government computers, everything would just black out, because nobody trusted each other anymore. It's a bit like you come home one day, you see that somebody tried to break into your house, the lock is damaged, he, he took something from your house, and you're not replacing the keys, because the house cleaner must be able to get in as well, right? It's a bit like that. And to make things worse, one of the ministers of the government said, people, don't worry, don't worry, everything is just fine, just look at the green lock in your address bar. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that really happened. And I'm not proud of that, of being Dutch right now. <laughs> anyway. At the end, what would have been the proper response was to update certif certificate verification lists. Uh, certificate verification lists are long lists uh, that certificate authorities maintain, and you can retrieve them easily without using HTTPS. So you don't need to trust them, you can just download them, and they will keep track of each and every certificate that they have revoked in the past. And if you go to a large certificate authority, uh, they will have like three, four, five hundred certificates that somehow have been compromised. It's not that they just expired, no. The company who bought the certificate was not too keen on their security procedures, they lost the private key, I don't know what, kind of stuff like that and they ask the authority that signed the certificate, please revoke it for me because it cannot be trusted anymore. Well, last demo for today. Let's see. Um, I think one of the larger banks here is Deutsche Bank, right? That, that at least that's, uh, okay, you have a lot of banks here, I know, but uh, that, that, that's one of the names that I, I, I came up with after Googling for Luxembourg Bank. So let, let's just try that one. Um, I'll imitate, uh, no, 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 wait, let's, let's first do a tiny different thing and let's hope that the connection is still alive. No, come on. Did I type it wrong? Oh, yeah, okay, that's not cool. See, I can't see my own typing, so that's... Fingers crossed. Yeah, that looks like it. Okay, they have a green lock in the address bar, so we're good to go. Wait, where did it go? Really? That takes ages, but I'm actually interested in 
Uh, let's see, security. View certificate, yes. Unfortunately, this can't be enlarged either way, but this is where you can actually view the certificate of a website that you're using. And you can see, um, if you have good eyes, or if you uh, try this yourself, you can see that there's a certificate down there, which is signed by another certificate, which is uh, finally signed by VeriSign Class Free Public Primary Certification. This is this root, this is this chain of trust that we talked about earlier. My computer trusts the, uh, the, the utmost one, and they have signed the middle one, and they have finally signed the lower one. And I don't know whether I can trust Deutsche Bank in advance, but I do know that I can trust very signed class free, and that's why I can trust this connection and be sure that it is uh, secured and nobody can read along. Okay? Um, now, if we use curl again, we can see what happens on the connection, um, and we can see interesting stuff about the security aspect of the connection. We can see it's a TLS 1.2 connection. We can see the selected cipher suite. Um, we can see the, s the chain of certificates. There's one that is issued to www.db.com. There's one semantic class free. There's one very signed class free. So this is, again, this chain of trust that we talked about. Um, but this is in a command line way, because often if you're on a production server, you don't have a Chrome browser available, which you can just use to call some kind of a web service. Um, but, if you, but you often have, do have curl. Yeah, we'll skip that one, because otherwise there's no time for questions left, and that would be a bad, bad thing. No. So we're finally there. Almost. Well. Come on. Like so. Okay, what have we seen? We've seen quite some demos, and to be sure that you know how you can use these tools yourself, let's run through them quickly. The first tool that I've been using was curl, and I often select the minus V and the minus K switches. Minus V is for be verbose, list what you are doing, list what's going down the wire. Minus K, to be used with care, ignore the certificate chain. Just accept the connection as is. But if you want to see whether the trust relationship is okay, omit the minus K. One that we did not see today, I would have done if we had a little bit more time, but we're running short on it, is OpenSSL itself. It's a bit harder to remember this command, so just take a picture if you need to. It says socket client, show the certificates being used in this connection, specify which server name we're going to use, and connect to some kind of an address on a certain port number. If you do this, you get really a lot of information, but you can see the, the, uh, all the things that are in the certificate, like the, 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 the common name and the validity and the, the, the signature and the, the key. You can see all that in there, and it's really a very good tool if you want to uh, troubleshoot a connection to some kind of a production server which doesn't seem to work, or you use OpenSSL s -Glide and you can just see, oh, but it's presenting another certificate than I thought it would. If you run Java, or any JVM language, in fact, you can select a different trust store. Trust stores are the files that contain all certificates that your JVM will trust. By default, there's one shipped with your JVM, and it contains about 160 root authorities, Johns, so as to say. But you can specify a file to, uh, you can specify a path to another file, and you can just put one certificate in there. For example, the very highly secured uh, JMS server, or uh, whatever event bus that you're using, but it has a uh, secured connection. And you can specify the password to that file by using this other system property. There's also a key store, which is the same format most of the times. But the key store is the file that contains any private keys that your application might need to co actually connect. Because what we didn't see today is mutual SSL. But it happens a lot in production systems. That not only the server needs to verify who he is, but also the client needs to prove who he is. And then again, you need to specify a password to that file. 
By the way, these two files can be the same file on disk. That's no problem. If you have a hard time debugging your SSL connection on your JVM, specify this system property. Jalfax net debug is all. You get a lot of information again, but it will most likely tell you where the handshake went wrong or what, what certificate wasn't trusted. And finally, if you are creating key stores and trust stores yourself, take a look at Portaclay, which is a nice graphical user interface. Um, if you ever have used the key tool command that comes with your JDK, it's not really easy to use. It has a very long parameter list. Portaclay will just give you a graphical user interface. You can point and click, import the certificate that you got emailed or that somebody gave to you, and then use that. That's it for me. I've told you everything that I know about this subject, or almost everything that is, and there are still some minutes left for questions, so please shoot. I see at least one hand waving. I don't know if there's a microphone for questions. There's no? Well, please shout and I'll try to repeat it. <laughs> Do I know let's, en let's encrypt is the question, and yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your opinion about them, since uh, they, they uh, allow you to also generate certificates in Greek? I think uh, it's not the uh, usual certification authority. Well, my opinion is about them, given the fact that they have a fully automated process to issue certificates. Um, well, actually, I think they do a pretty neat job. At the end of the day, a certificate is no more than saying this domain name is using this private public key pair. And if I can prove that I own this domain name, and I do, if I use their tool, I must prove I'm owner of the domain, then they have no reason to reject that certificate to me and not to sign it. And I actually think it's, it's cool because uh, until when they got in business, you would pay a lot of money to get that done. And all they would do is check that you're the owner of the DNS record. Really? <laughs> that costs 100, 200, I don't know how many hundreds of, of euros. And they are like, well, that's an easy check. We can easily do that for you. And there's no reason why we should actually ask you such an enormous amount of money. On the other hand, that's also the danger. It, also, it only states, yes, the owner of, this, uh, of the, the, the keys that are, uh, are indeed owned by the owner of this domain. But it does not say that the owner of the domain is the person that you are trying to contact. For example, if you made a typo, and you didn't type db.com but bd.com, and somebody would have hijacked that domain, just bought it, installed some site that looks exactly like the Deutsche Bank. And, well, they can get a Let's Encrypt certificate. And that's why the certificate authorities came with this part, where they charge you a lot of extra money, to display the name of the legal entity back uh, there, next to the green lock icon. It's, it's quite a lot of extra money you pay for that, and it only makes sure that they will not only check you own the domain, but also that you are some kind of legal entity. They will just look at the uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, and write down the name and copy that into the certificate. But I cannot fake that. I can buy BD.com, but I can never be the legal entity in the Chamber of Commerce. So that's, that's what I f f uh, did to tackle that. But actually, to me, Let's Encrypt does, does a good job there. They do what, uh, what is the least required to have a uh, secure connection. Any other questions? I think there's room for at least one. Yes? That's a good, uh, good addition, uh, indeed. If you would allow me, I'll just repeat it. But okay. I don't think everybody would heard it. Um, what, what this guy said is it's not specific to Let's Encrypt. Every certificate authority will issue that BD.com certificate. Okay. Yes, please?
security problems around that are more related to the number of certificate of authority. This is exactly what you said. If you consider that some also come from some governments, yeah. uh, if it has a moderate trust on that. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which, which will then intercept all the traffic. Yeah, yeah indeed. So that's why when you do, do web development, uh, you ask, no, I think you have to rely on uh, technologies that are complementary to, to just enabling a HTTPS. But if you don't think like uh, HTTPS, when you, when you say, oh, if you connect with that domain, this is the certificate that you should get. Yeah. And that, that if you don't get this one, it's definitely you know, not that trustworthy. That yeah. Yeah, exactly. So It's, it's a bit long to repeat since we have 30 seconds according to the monitor here, but thanks for your remarks and the person that sit next to you will definitely have learned something from that. If there's no more questions and I think there's simply no more time left for them, thanks for being here, merci bien, and have a nice day and have a nice holiday tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>